How can we make the world better? By making ourselves better. The Dr. Joe Show explores how you can make positive personal change by using his groundbreaking and highly effective I Am approach to understand who we are and why we do what we do. Your small changes can have big effects. Join us now for the Dr. Joe Show with Mark Stiles of Stiles Law, Thomas McCoy, and your host, Dr. Joe Schrand. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dr. Joe Show. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. It, you know, Tom, I, I think there was maybe only one, one or two times that you've been able to do that because we were finally able to get rid of Mark for a little while. It is the semi-annual Tom and Joe show, if you will. But Mark is actually up in New Hampshire talking with um, a person who owns a very large, beautiful building up there uh, in Lincoln, New Hampshire. Because this, if all goes according to plan, will be the site of the very first I Am Institute which will be taking uh, the I am approach, which as you know, is just believing that everybody's doing the best they can. And we will be teaching that to other people who will then be able to go out and spread the word. And people can come in there and it will be not just about psychology, not just about psychiatry, but about everything. Because the I am approach is applicable to so many things. So somebody may come in who's having um, you know, a difficulty in their business, and they want to know how do we use the I am approach to do that. Somebody may come in who is a chief executive of a company. How do we use the I am approach in our company? So it is very exciting. I want to thank Mark so much for putting this together. And if you're listening, Mark, I appreciate it because my oxytocin levels have increased, and I am at a whole different I am. So thank you. What do you think about that, Tom? Socrates. Plato, Aristotle, Dr. Joe. <laughs> uh, my narcissism is intact. But with that in mind, Tom, can you introduce our wonderful guest for tonight? Oh, my pleasure. Well, tonight, Dr. Joe, we've got Josh Garneau, Managing Director of Improv Boston, as well as co-producer of the award-winning Kerfuffle, and Zoe Bradford, co-founder and artistic director of the Company Theater in Norwell. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Pleasure welcome. to be here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is, it is wonderful to have you guys here. Uh, Zoe, I, I, I want to just start with you if you could. And, and, and Josh, be attentive. I know you will be because we are <laughs> going to be talking about theater. But we're also going to be talking about theater right now in the age of COVID because um, it, it's got to be different. I mean, just differences with how quickly the, you know, Wi-Fi kicks in. So... So what, what's been going on there at uh, Company Theater? Okay, Joe, what a great question. Well, uh, after we all uh, sunk in on the initial shock of the fact that we weren't going to be able to perform last year, um, you know, on stage as usual, uh, I really uh, made sure that we still had our educational program intact. Of course, people were afraid to uh, come on site, but we have basically become outdoors you know so that's what we did for the summer uh, which is fine because we do a lot of outdoor activity uh at our theater anyway during the summertime because we have a big educational arm the academy of the company theater it's been very successful we love it and uh it, it creates um wonderful performers of the future we have quite a few improv uh artists <laughs> attending that by the way and, and just everything we offer everything from photography to uh, fencing. I mean, it's just, yeah, anything you can, very eclectic. So we carried on with I, that. I just want, I just want to interrupt because- Of course, there was a fear of, of COVID, so we had to reduce classes and all of that. I mean, at the academy, I think, um, I think my kids went there. They did, they yeah. did, indeed they did. And I had a wonderful time with your kids. We've seen generation after generation. We started in 1987. Uh, and moved, and then when we took over our theater in 1992, of course, we really started flourishing with uh, the ed the educational portion of what we do. But um, it was very important to me not to compromise 
what our brand is, if that makes sense to you, Joe. So when people are like, oh, why don't you just do one small thing or do a concert outside or do the, you know, all that's great, but it's not who we are. Uh, so, but but because we couldn't set idle and because we had to keep in the public eye and because it's so vital that we keep some monies rolling in, we did two outdoor fundraisers. One was in conjunction, we teamed up with the Hingham Historical Society. And for the entire month of October, we were performing outside. We did a uh, haunted Hingham tour and people played historic characters. Um, a lot of, all, tons of my actors volunteered. And like I say, it ran uh, for the whole month uh, on weekends, uh, sold out uh, so fast your head would spin. I had told the, uh, Deidre Anderson who we partnered with I said, she was like, oh, we could just try this for a couple of nights. I said, no, 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 <laughs> this has got to be the whole month. I said, this is going to go nuts. And she's like, oh, I don't know. We don't sell that. I said, no, no, you got to trust me. This is going to go wild. And it did. It, the thing completely sold out in a day and a half. Um, and we had to add more um, tours. So we did that. And that was so successful. Um, and in the meantime, we just did a Zoom uh, theater performance with our youth. Uh, which is not the same and they did as best they could with special effects thrown in and backgrounds and various things and sound effects but it's it's not the same as live everybody knows that the kids are getting very zoomed out they do it on for school there they have to do it with their friends they're sick of it quite frankly so that's a big challenge but uh, because that was so the haunted hingham tour was so successful we moved on and did a um, a uh, victorian christmas tour and ran that for uh, the month of December on weekends and once again sold out wildly, which was great. We did it on, on property as opposed to being in downtown Hingham, which was wonderful. We tried to, uh, as much as we could within our very limited budget, uh, light up the whole grounds and, and so it became very enchanted. We have little locations on site that were interesting and we took a very uh, Victorian look at uh, the holiday which was nice because it kind of brought people back down to what the holiday really is and it had less commercialism and more about story, myth, legend and uh, kindness and and uh, you know some beautiful stories of the season. So that was super successful. Now it's cold so we're not doing anything outside until March, we have planned a uh, St. Patrick's Day uh, thing that will run the first two weekends of, of March plus St. Patty's Day itself, in which we will once again kind of do sort of a pub thing. We'll, this will be more geared for adults as opposed to entire family. We'll uh, have a craft beer. We'll tell all kinds of stories and have songs. Well, you know, very limited. You got to be far away when you sing because of COVID. You've got to be at least uh, 10 to 20 feet away from your people. Um, in very small groups will come in and they, they'll enjoy that. Past that, I've put it together a season, um, you know, oh, and then we're going to do an Alice in Wonderland immersive with the kids and teens. Uh, so it's not a traditional Alice in Wonderland. It's a, a kind of a, it's that story, but it's going to take you on a live journey where you're interactive. So we're trying to think outside the box um and but still make it really enchanting and beautiful that's who we are we're very visual and we're very um unique so i um i just want to make sure it's got our company theater stamp on it and i love doing stuff outside but really our signature is great big musicals and of course we're on on tremendous hold for that and we are very hopeful we can get back on track with at least half to three quarter houses by June. Mm. There you go. There's my answer. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and that's there's... if I'm not mistaken, Rock of Ages. Uh, well, actually, um, when we were uh, in rehearsal uh, in in um, February and March, we were in the process of rehearsing The Wiz with a wonderfully diverse cast, beautiful cast of kids and teens. Um, super strong piece and that got interrupted about three weeks before it was about to, supposed to open and in the meantime we had just opened one night only fun home so the plan is to start with fun home the set is still up and it is a gorgeous piece of uh, theatrical building by um, Ryan Barrow and uh, we want to open with that and I know that cast crew and orchestra everybody is standing by just they it really was a masterpiece joe i i don't mean to brag but it was really a brilliant 
brilliant piece. We want to reopen with that. Uh, it had a super cast from um, Bo Greater Boston and all over. And then go into the Wiz, which will take a couple weeks of rehearsal, and then we'll go we'll go into Rock of Ages. Fingers crossed that all that can start happening by the summertime. We don't we don't know. Yeah, but boy, we right. have our. But it'll be great on so crossed. many levels because it, that's really clever to just to, to keep the set and reopen with that show because it's around the same time you get nostalgic for a show. Right. Exactly. And. The cast was so proud of it um, that that one night we performed it was a night that uh, in my career, my long career in theater, that I will never forget. The energy in the room, the the, the pending fact that you know we don't know when we will be back again, um, and the the passion of how people wanted to perform this thing was uh, really off the Richter scale. So when we do reopen with it. Uh, people are, I think people are really going to go wild for it. So that, well, that will be great. And like, like you say, it's the thing is it's ready it, you know, it, we can get it together probably in a week, you know, so that's going to be amazing too, you know, uh, because we'll be ready to jump right in on a show. And, and off air guys, we were having a talk about, you know, what this really means in terms of. The finances, obviously, and uh, you know, you, you can't, it's not necessarily sustainable. Josh, you want to tell us a little bit about what's going on with Improv Boston? What isn't going on? Uh, so, you know, similar to to Zoe, when this all first started, uh, we had to make some very quick decisions. Uh, we do when we were up and running, uh, 30 different shows a week. Uh, so not just 30 performances of one show, but 30 completely unique shows. Mm. Uh, so we had to put all 30 on pause, uh, you know, back in the early days of this, when we thought, oh, this will be two weeks or, you know, they say it's two weeks, we'll, we'll budget for a month. Uh, and then we'd be coming back. Right. Uh, so we put things on pause. Uh, we made the, it was, it was tough because we did it before the governor announced it. We said, you know, we're, we're going to just close. We're not comfortable with this. Our performers aren't comfortable with it. Uh, we were right down the street from, uh, Biogen where that big outbreak happened. So we said, you know, let's just be a little more cautious. Um, and by nature, you know, as, as I'm sure you all can relate to, we're, we're restless people. We wanted to be doing things. Uh, and within a week, we said to ourselves, there's no reason we can't do things. We, we spun up shows uh, within the first week. Uh, I was incredibly proud of my artistic director and the artistic uh, uh, community at my theater. Uh, within a few weeks, we had classes up and running. We were, we were sort of running full tilt ahead uh, and just going forward. Uh, through some wonderful help through the city, uh, the, the local business improvement district, we managed to secure uh, space at an outdoor theater in partnership with the Central Square, Central Square Theater and um, uh, the dance complex in Central Square. Uh, we did a few shows there throughout the summer. Uh, it was a custom built uh, outdoor stage complete with risers and a PA and a, and a for real stage uh, made so that it was COVID safe. People could sit in, in socially distanced ways. There were procedures in place. Uh, we involved uh, an epidemiologist and made sure that we could keep people absolutely safe. Uh, and as far as I know, we were, we were very successful with that. Um, and then as the summer started winding down, the fall started happening, uh, our PPPL money, which we had been relying on, ran out, and there was no further assistance coming. And as we were saying on the break, you know, these these measures, the outdoor theater, the online classes, the online shows, they give you, you know, at the end of it, $10 a week, but we still had this giant rent bill to pay. Uh, and so we made a really tough decision to to close the doors of the theater and say we're going dark. The full-time staff is going to go furloughed. Uh, the online theater, because obviously the physical theater was closed, uh, but the online theater is going to close. Uh, no more classes, no more shows, because it we would rather pay our rent than pay the staff to, you know, to work full time and make the $20 that we were making. Um, so we've been in furlough since uh, July. Uh, um, <clears throat> 
as time went on and our money went down, uh, we actually had to make the toughest decision of all, the second toughest decision of all, which was to walk away from our theater. Uh, and we closed our doors, uh, or not closed them, but we, we, we jettisoned the lease in, um, God, I think it was November at this point. I, I could be getting my months wrong. Uh, but we were basically looking at the bank account and we were looking at the rent bill and we said, there's no way that we can do this for another two months. This is just too much for an empty building. Uh, and we know that when we're ready to come back, it will be very hard to find a space, but at least by getting rid of the dead weight, we, there is a we to come back. Otherwise we would have had to just close the agency altogether. Um, and uh, you know, at, at this point, we've been around for, for 40 years, and we said it's more important to save the organization than it is to save the physical theater. So uh, right now, we are in the very, very earliest process of reawakening the beast. Uh, I, I had a conversation with my, my marketing director and my comedy, my comedy education comedy school, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, comedy school director last week. Uh, so that we can sort of start the process of at least getting some online classes up and running again. Uh, we do have a, a small physical stage still that we can fall back to. Uh, we held on to two of our training spaces, three of our training spaces, uh, although one is currently sublet. Um, so if it does get to a point, you know, as you say, Zoe, in, in July, where people are starting to feel like they could be in a room together. Uh, we do have an option for at least small shows, uh, possibly doing a small in-person show that we then stream out as opposed to this type of Zoom show. Um, and, you know, to emphasize your points, Joe, it's been, for us, flexibility is built into the art form. Uh, it is it is one of the key tenets of, of improv. So we've just been sort of rolling with everything and saying, what can we do to make sure that A, we protect the organization, but B, continue to do our art uh, because it does matter to us. We enjoy doing it. We, we think it brings a value to the world. So the decisions have been twofold on, you know, one hand, make sure that IB stays around. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, <laughs> we have to have enough money, uh, uh, but we want to have fun while we're doing it. So it's been a busy few months. Yeah, I, I appreciate both of you talking about this because I don't think people sometimes understand what it really means to run a theater, um, how much work goes on so that the audience can see this remarkable piece of art. Um, and boy it, it's it's a tough tough time obviously you know we were saying off air one of my phrases is you know for COVID, adaptation is innovation and it, it sounds like both of you you know have been able to innovate but then you know theater you can't just do it outside in in the middle of winter it, as, as Zoe, as you're saying it's just it's just simply too cold right. so yeah, how, right how do COVID. you how do you adapt? Are, 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 so are, are you doing any online stuff or streaming things like, like Josh was talking about? Well, Joe, the, the, Josh is right on it. I mean, that you just, you can do it, but you're not going to make, uh, it's, you don't, we're all furloughed too. There's nobody on salary at my place. We're all volunteering to keep company theater alive any way we can. Um, mm -hmm. If we, if we can, I mean, I, you know, if we can, that's, uh, I mean, we will survive. There's no, there's no question in my mind about it. We, we've had a lot of great community support, Central Bank, make sure we got our uh, PPP uh, P loan. Uh, and, and there's another one coming, thank God. So um, that could be a real lifesaver for us. Senator O'Connor uh, went to bat for us at the state house and got us a grant uh, with unrestricted funds. God, what a lifesaver that's going to be. But instead of saying, oh, great, we can just put that towards beautiful theater, what we're forced to do is, okay, we're going to have to look at our facility, look at, um, you know, touchless, uh, you know, bathroom um, fixtures. We're going to have to look at um, 
possibly new filtration system. Um, our parking lot needs work. So that's, you know, not anything to do with COVID, but it's, it's desperately needed. Um, and we, we park a lot of, you know, uh, we have a very large parking lot. We're on, we're on 3.2 acres. We have a very large facility uh, between our education and the, and the theater itself. So if we didn't furlough and just say, okay, except for these wild and crazy things that we can do outside, um, which we've ke kept as fundraisers and put a, a pretty good price tag on because we need the community to know we ha we have no income um, besides their benevolence right now because we can't sell any tickets. Um, that will keep, that's basically the only way we can sustain until we can safely reopen. And I'm sorry for Josh having to, you know, sort of give up the, his space is just, it's just heartbreaking. I mean, we, we, uh, we have a very dramatic story about getting our theater and I, uh, because, because myself and my partners made an enormous sacrifice after we got it, we wanted it so desperately. And when we finally got our actual theater, um, we all, uh, took less, uh, we on executive, uh, positions took less salary so we could pay off the mortgage. So, mm -hmm. um, we own, we own our building and that's a lifesaver right now. If we had to come up with a mortgage, on top of uh, the heat, you know, just sustainable heat because we live in New England, let's face it, it's, you know, gonna be uh, 20 degrees tomorrow and everything's gonna freeze if we don't, we have to keep everything at 50 degrees in the whole complex and that even is costing, you know, costs a couple thousand a month just to do that. So, you know, when you don't have the income, it just all drifts away. So COVID has been a killer, <laughs> I will say that. True. Zoe, some of the things you were just saying too, it's it's so hard when you go to do fundraising, right? You want to say, we're doing fundraising to do this amazing show. We're going to make beautiful scenery and, and people are going to have emotions. And instead you're like, well, I actually need to just put, you know, I want to make it so that when you stand up from the toilet, it flushes. And right. that's not, people don't want to give you money for that. They, not appealing, you know, no. They don't want to give you money to pay your bills. Like, uh, uh, you know, insurance and uh, uh, the heating bill and the tax bills. And, you know, obviously we're a nonprofit, but there are still taxes that we have to pay on, on stuff. And it's so hard to say to people, you know, when we were still open and paying staff, we want to do fundraising so that, you know, I can put food in my belly and so that my staff can, can pay their rent and, and all the rest of it. it that's not the, the fun stuff. And, you know, just rent alone for us in Cambridge on our space was twenty thousand dollars a month. Wow! You know, before we gave it up, and wow. just rent. You know, not talking about utilities or the, the insurance, which is through the roof when you have performers and audience members and all the rest of it. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, we at the beginning of it in March, when we were still relatively optimistic, we 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 said our essential expenses are seventy five thousand dollars a month, mm -hmm. and we shortly winnowed that down quite a bit, but it's still hefty, yeah. uh, uh, hefty, hefty. And it's so hard to raise that kind of money when your primary way of making money normally for, for us at least, uh, is, is selling tickets. Uh, you right. know, when you have 30 shows a week at $20 a pop, that's a lot of money that goes directly into keeping the business open. Us too, same thing. We're, we're basically uh, very reliant on ticket sales. We ha do have a few corporate sponsors, but you know, it's 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 not. Um, it, it, we can't we can't sustain on that, and, and one shouldn't. One should be able to be self-sustaining. That's very important, mm -hmm. and uh, proud of it. And I'm sure mm -hmm. you are sure you are too, Josh. That you can really say I'm relying on just what we do as our art, and people are going to come and see it until all of a sudden you discover <laughs> that you can't sell tickets and all these theaters that have been funded through grants and fundraising for decades are all of a sudden feeling much better than I am with my ticket sales. <laughs> right, uh, right. Uh, but you know, it is in normal worlds, I think it is, uh, we are a nonprofit, but we run very much like a full profit business in our, in our, our, fundraising uh we sell tickets we we do education similar to you we had a fairly large education complex uh which uh the nightmare situation was we had a class that was supposed to start on march 20th uh oh, there a, it is yeah eight, eight week 
a class with a thousand students uh, and all of a sudden they now, most of them are still waiting for their class because we said, we want to give you what you paid for. Um, and so we still have this debt to fulfill, uh, this obligation to fulfill. It's, it's all, you know. Yes, us, us too, Josh. We, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that the, major, the majority of ticket holders either donated or rolled over their tickets mm -hmm. into the next year. It was a minority that, that insisted on their money back. And yeah. that has been a sustaining fact that we could just, they let us hold on to their, to their money or they donated it, you know, was just beautiful because it really, you know, each little chunk of 50 bucks here or a hundred there, it really makes a difference uh, yeah. in a big picture. I mean, even in a small picture, I'm at a point now where I'm calling up, you know, companies being like, that bill you sent me for $20, let's talk. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, 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 we've been closed since since March. What are you doing sending me a bill? Uh, yeah, hmm. not nice. <laughs> what, what a dilemma for, for people. Do you guys um, have some donation sites? I mean, is there a way for people to donate money? Do you have websites? Zoe? Oh, I, I certainly uh, do. www.companytheater.com puts us right to a website, to our website, and it's uh, donate. There's a donate here button. Also on our Facebook page, there's a donate button that you can go to. It's very simple. You can choose one of two different ways, uh, things that you can donate to, and uh, you know, and it, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. So thank you for asking. Josh, what about you? Uh, likewise, thank you for asking. Uh, our homepage is improvboston.com. Uh, and similarly, there is a donate button there. Or you can just go directly to improvboston.com slash donate. Um, and if you have a dollar or five dollars or, or, or five million, if you just are that person who won the Powerball, uh, feel free. Uh, <laughs> if you're listening out there in Maryland, because I know it was in Maryland, we know that you're listening to the Dr. Joe <laughs> Show. <laughs> Send some stuff over. You know, so, Joe. What, what? Also, if I could just mention, you know, um, we. I was supposed to be on your show this summer, and um, the day that my show was scheduled um, was the day my longtime partner, uh, theater partner Jordy Saucerman, uh, died of cancer. So yes. obviously, we had to cancel. Um, the outpouring of, um, you know, uh, donations in her honor. If there was ever a time we needed money, <laughs> I mean, um, I would rather have Jordy a million times over than any money, but um, I miss her terribly every day. But um, people have, she Im talk about an impact of a life. Um, o overwhelming to think how many people not only donated anything from $5 to $5,000, but um, the, the letters and the comments and the, Talk about life changing. I know we were, were thinking about how how do you influence somebody's life? And Jordy was, um, uh, in her way, was able to make everyone who kind of walked through those company theater doors, virtually everyone, feel like they were at home. And it was very, very extraordinary and different. Um, and actors love to say, I've returned home when they come to our theater, even if they haven't performed for us for 20 years or only did one show, uh, they say, I'm home again. Um, and, I, you know, her uh, acceptance um, of people uh, so, since we started, uh, the, the underdog, the kid who's a little bit different, the adult who feels lost, the LGBT community, uh, the LGBT, um, et cetera, community was just found a place where total acceptance um, in, in times where you couldn't even talk about that. So, I mean, I think um, uh, people really uh, helped us in, in this struggling time, you know, in, in a, like I say, the timing, well, it was helpful that so many people understood that we do more than just theater. And I think there, I think the greater community says, don't let company theater die, you know, because of COVID. Uh, well, I, I, I appreciate you bringing Jordy up, you know, because it, it was devastating for so many people. Um, and it, it really, folks, just, you know, Zoe was was scheduled to be our guest to talk about how do we 
help company theater and manage it. And then this, this tragedy. So mm. you know, she was uh, a remarkable influence. I, I hope, I hope our listeners recognize what you can do to influence other people. This is, you know, the second part of the I am. You control no one, you influence everyone. You get to choose the kind of influence you want to be. And certainly in the arts, in theater in particular, musical theater, improvisational theater, this is an influence that can be life-changing on people. Um, Josh, you guys also have classes um, for kids, uh, right? And uh, Mm -hmm. certainly for adults, teaching them improvisational theater. How, How do you think that's helped influence people? Oh God, uh, you know, as as Zoe was saying, uh, uh, first off, my condolences. I I've heard a lot about Thank Jordy you. over the years. Uh, you know, the theater community around here is small enough that that the good people get their names out there, uh, uh, and you know, for for Improv Boston. It's the classes, it's the the shows themselves. Uh, the thing that drew me in, uh, uh, however many years ago, was that it, it was something you just said, Zoe, that, that really felt true for me at, at Improv Boston, that this felt like a home. And for so many people that have been there since then, uh, uh, for your Melissa Carubia for a while, uh, for a lot of the people that were there, uh, you know, in, in 2020 and that will hopefully be back there. Uh, Improv Boston has really felt like a home through the, through the concept of accepting who people are and just taking that into every aspect of the performance. Cause it's, it's a tentative improv, right? If I come to you and I say, this is who I am, your job on stage is to agree to it and emphasize that. And that somehow translates to off stage as well. If I come to you and say, this is who I am, people say, great, let's go get a, you know, get a snack at the bar next door or whatever it is. There, there's no uh, hangups on, on any of it really. And, I think the impact that that has on people is really profound. There was a moment in time a few months ago now where the city of Cambridge was proposing taking emergency money and giving it to the arts. And there was a a period of public comment where people could call into a town hall meeting and and speak in favor of this. And I was very proud of the Improv Boston community. Uh, We far and away blew all the other artistic communities in the city out of the water. It was all improv Boston people. And there were so many people who just said the same things over and over again, that this was the place where as an adult, they could come to feel accepted and valued for who they were, uh, which they couldn't find anywhere else. Um, and that was, you know, men, women, uh, uh, people of, of, you know, different nationalities, uh, gender representations, sexualities, the whole works. Uh, and it is, it's really important. It's an important part of who we are. Um, and, you know, similar to what you were saying, Zoe, uh, whether it's financial or through advocacy, that's really come through in the past year or so as people have really fought to keep the place alive. And, and as you guys know, I mean, that's what Drug Story Theater is all about as well. You know, my my nonprofit, we use improvisational theater where the mantra is yes and. You know, yes and. You build on. How how many times have we heard uh, yes but? You know, we live in a world so much that it is yes but you can't do this or yes but you should be doing that as opposed to yes and. And that that creates, especially in kids, this sense of value and joy and and improvisational theater and theater as well but improvisational theater in particular for adolescents and young kids and and kids who have autistic spectrum it's powerful because it takes the limbic system this impulsive brain and shifts you to the prefrontal cortex the thoughtful brain because you have to act on the yes and what somebody else says to you and out of the theater community in general, it, it does. It becomes a family. You know, I, I, it was a huge influence on my life, theater. And that's part of why I wanted both of you here tonight so our audience can hear and understand 
this is a part of our culture that we cannot lose. And what I'm hearing is that, you guys, even in the midst of, of this financial dilemma, of this COVID that is really crushing us, the show must go on. And it will go on. It touches everyone. And we've got, we've got a few minutes left in the show. And I, I just want to tie this back into the I am. It just, it's just a coincidence that, that improv and I am starts with the same letter. But um, the, the I am is, is saying that we're all doing the best we can. Uh, that at every moment in time, we are doing the best we can with the potential to change in the very next second to another best we can. This is your current maximum potential. This is who I am and I matter. The I am is influenced by four domains. Our home domain, we all know that the home has had an influence on who you are. The social domain, which is the rest of the world, especially, you know, right now we're talking about that social domain where you as your family may bring your home into a theater space and share an experience with each other in a remarkable social domain. And that affects your biological domain because you know that it feels something when you're sitting in a theater and you're either laughing or crying or, or, or wondering what will happen next. This is your biological domain of play. And then the I see domain. How do I see myself? How do I think other people see me? And I can tell you from personal experience in the theater, there is nothing like being up on stage and at the end of the show having an audience applause. This is part of what we are doing with Drug Street Theater, is where we're giving these kids the pleasure of that experience. And that pleasure is directly related to you. Because when you, the audience, are applauding our kids, you are reminding them of their value. And for them, I am delighted to say that is better than drugs and alcohol. Because these four domains interconnect, a small change can have a big effect. You don't need to change everything. So I want to ask both of our guests, with your experience with theater, with improvisational, what small change can you recommend to our audience? Josh, I'm going to start with you this time. What small change can you recommend to our audience? Hopefully, you know, to talk about maybe getting through COVID. Uh, the small change that I was about to say is completely the opposite for, for getting through COVID advice. Then was, go with that, Josh. Uh, this is improvisation. <laughs> Let's talk about that one. I was about What's to small change? Uh, take the chance, uh, you know, because in improv, it isn't about <laughs> taking those chances, right? It's about saying, I'm going to do something a little weird or something that I just popped into my head and I'm going to roll with it. And I, I'm going to trust that the people around me are going to roll with it too. Uh, and of course, when it comes to COVID, you don't want to take the chance. Good point. Uh, good point. Please don't take the chance. Uh, uh, but you know, I think that after after doing my thing at the Improv Theater for for well over a decade at this point, I think that, and, and I'm not a performer, but I work very much with the performers as a tech uh, now as the as the managing director. the The biggest takeaway that I've been able to get from it is that. Every single thing you can do is essentially a trust fall where you can catch yourself. Uh, if you just say, I'm going to take this chance and I'm going to do it, whether it's, it's, you know, I really do want that meatball sandwich for lunch, uh, something as small and inconsequential as that, or I'm going to just make a career change and everything's going to be great. Uh, and sometimes you mess it up and you just keep on going, but you took the chance and you figured it out. Uh, and I think that's the change I, I push to people all the time, just take those steps yeah yeah so what about you what small change you recommend if it's a change exact exactly but i think i just want to emphasize how important it is to as an audience member to um accept the fact that it is a changing world and um you know we have always been about diversity about people of color fitting in, about people of who are maybe a little bit different fitting in. And we're going to continue to give you entertainment as you've expected, but you're going to also see the unexpected and be ready and be ready for the change. Uh, because we, because this is a, uh, like I say, it's a changing world. Things are fast moving and, and 
and people, I just going to say, open your hearts and your minds because we're going to, we're still going to knock your socks off. We're still going to bring you traditional entertainment. We're also going to bring you new things. And I, I think, um, you know, as people become involved, um, they'll, they'll see the, the richness of diversity uh, in that diversity can be in any capacity. I think that's really special and something that people can look forward to. Dr. Joe, if I may. Please, Ben. Uh, yeah, so uh, as I was saying in the off-air chat, I was also displaced from the live event industry, so uh, I just wanted to chime in a little bit with this because what you folks are doing is, is the ultimate form of art. Theater is one of the most important things, in my opinion at least, on this planet. We don't have that. We lose a lot culturally. Uh, now, where I came from was actually more on the corporate side. Uh, I was a large venue projectionist. Uh, for one thing, as well as working with the tech end of pretty much everything else. So, Josh, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. All the buttons and knowing what they do. It's a very scary situation, folks. And, Tom, you can back me up on that, too. Uh, but I just wanted to say in that regard, uh, we talk a lot about this on WMEX, 15, 10 a.m., had to throw the plug out there, uh, about the live event industry, where really, I mean, when you consider the, uh, the bills and whatnot that were passed recently, and I say recently like it was yesterday, we're talking a few months ago at this point, it didn't do much for those 1099s out there. It didn't do much for the folks that literally their entire life's income is based solely upon this 1099 status, and the government mm. did not recognize that, and a lot of us are still... I mean, I know people that are 40-plus years in this industry have not had a paycheck since March of last year. Yeah. I mean... I was one of those uh, unfortunate ones that one day the boss just called a meeting in the middle of the warehouse. We're all working on whatever it was. And he said, guys, girls, you don't work here no more. Sorry. Bye. You know, and it's, it was the unfortunate reality. And I know we're coming up on the end of the show here, but I just wanted to say, bless you guys for doing what you're doing and keeping theater and art alive because it's one of the most important aspects that we could ever save. So hold on. Don't ever let go. And we back you 110% across the WATD network. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Very welcome. You know, Step off my soapbox really, now. It gets to the second part of the I am, which you talked about a little bit earlier. You control no one. You influence everyone. Um, Josh, I'm going to start with you again and then end with Zoe. What kind of influence are you hoping you will be? Uh, you know, I was, I was struggling with this when you sent it out earlier. Uh, I'm still not entirely sure what I'm going to say, so I'm going to make it up as I go. This is how I do things. Uh, <laughs> Improv is best, folks, right here on the Dr. Joe Show. <laughs> you know, I I have taken a lot of pride over the years in the fact that uh, I'm a person who likes to just show up and get things done, and I want it to be very quiet, uh, and I don't make a big fuss over it. And my goal is that you never know I was there except for the fact that something now works or is done. Uh, and... It's always been that way. Things just get done, like the stage is painted or the theater is all of a sudden not broke. Uh, and I think that what I would like for, you know, me, for Improv Boston to continue to be is just the theater that gets stuff done. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, when, when we were under the first people out there to be doing online shows, we just spun them around and did it. Uh, so that's the influence of innovation. And that, you know, that is incredible, especially in this day and age, because adaptation is innovation. So we've got one minute left. Uh, okay, you? I'll just say renaissance. It's going to feel like a renaissance when we reopen. And, you know, the, but the influencing starts with tiny, tiny things. You're a mentor. Your um, uh, and you don't even realize it sometimes. You're, you know, a, somebody comes in the door and 20 years later they're telling you what an experience they had. So keep on doing what we're doing. You both are heroes. And please, folks, donate. Go to those sites. Let's keep theater alive. Thank you. We'll be back next week with the Dr. Joe Show. Thanks and happy birthday, Ben. Thanks, Dr. Joe. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Joe.